about him, it is really lovely to see you. Now, you were nine when you were cast as Jean Louise Scout Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. You'd never acted in a movie before. Step me through how the opportunity came to be. My mum was a, an actress and she had her own radio show and um, she worked at the local town and gown theatre. Our theatre manager, I guess you'd call him, he told my mother that he had these movie people coming to interview for children for this film. And he thought that she should bring me in. And he said, she's about the right age and coloring and all that. So uh, mother said, well, I'd have to ask Henry, my father. Mm -hmm. Daddy said, no. <laughs> And mom was pretty sharp cookie. And she said, now, Henry, dear, what are the chances the child will get the part anyway? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> and you maintained a 41-year friendship with your co-star, Gregory Peck, to the point where you had pet names for one another. I called him Atticus and he called me kiddo. I didn't know what else to call him <laughs> because we were too familiar for Mr. Peck and we were, you know, so close. Um, but I wasn't going to call him Greg at 10 years old. So it was Atticus for me. I lost my parents very early in my life. My mom passed away three weeks after I graduated from high school and my father died shortly after I got married. And Atticus really kept up with me and jumped in the void. And it was nothing for me to pick up the phone and um, he would be on the other end of the phone. You know, what are you doing, kiddo? What are you reading? How, how are you, how's school going? And, and that was so um, supportive for me. I really needed that as a child. And it remained with me my whole life. He was so like Atticus. Tell me what it was like for a nine-year-old making a movie on a universal soundstage. I was just so innocent. I didn't know anything. And I just took it all as great fun. And okay, this is what we're doing now. It was just kind of matter of fact. And I knew nothing about movies or acting or any of that sort of thing. And I just took it as, as a game almost. It was fun. You said in an interview not long ago, it was painful to watch the movie 60 years on. Why for you was it painful? Because everybody's gone. I mean, most everybody has died except for Boo and, and Jem. Robert Duvall and Philip Alford. Mm -hmm. I don't get to see either of them very often. So it's really kind of sad, you know, that when I when I do have to watch clips of it, I have to tell myself that, oh, that's my daughter up there or something. You know? Yeah. It was just over 60 years ago that To Kill a Mockingbird was released. It really went to highlight the racial injustices, inequality and, and flat out bigotry long before any other movies were doing that. Um, it was a it was a really difficult piece to get sold to the uh, studios. Nobody wanted to touch it. Universal picked it up when Gregory Peck okayed the that he was going to be in it, um, and he was putting his money where his mouth was because he helped support it. I call this God's picture because during that time period it was so desperately needed. And it's so timely even today because we're still, we still haven't learned all these life's lessons that are in this story. Um, we're still dealing with racial injustice and bigotry. We're seeing that in, in a very strong way in the last few years, especially here in the United States. Um, and you know, we're still dealing with single family parenting and how hard that is. And I would 
love to be able to say that we're going to grow out of it, but I don't know that we really will, unfortunately. So that's why this story is still so important and that we need to revisit these lessons over and over again. Did you know at the time that this movie was going to be so powerful? I I know that Alan Pakula, Bob Mulligan, and Gregory Peck, they knew that they wanted it to be very powerful and they wanted it to be very consequential. And it was. I don't even think we got complete scripts. And it wasn't until I saw the film at the premiere that I knew what the full story was. Um, and it was hard. I mean, it was, it was very upsetting, uh, during the trial scene because we weren't allowed to see any of that being filmed. Brock Peters, of course, who played Tom Robinson, the black man falsely accused of raping the white woman. What was Brock like? He was wonderful. He was so full of fun as was Atticus. I mean, they both, you know, love to laugh and have a good time. And I tell people all the time, I had reverse Oreo daddies because (laughs) I had my daddy, I had Gregory Peck, and I had Brock Peters. I've been so blessed. I mean, really to have good solid male role models is so important to our girls. And, um, you know, they, they live the, the life and, and, and they really shared that with me and took care of me and helped me develop into who I am today. To Kill a Mockingbird wasn't only your movie debut, it was also Robert Duval's movie debut. What do you remember about Robert Duval on set? I have to really kind of backtrack a little bit to the brilliance of our director, Bob Mulligan. We were not allowed to see anyone until after we were totally done filming with them. Because I had not seen Robert Duvall out of character, (laughs) the first time I saw him was he was sitting on some pallets by the back door and he goes, aren't you going to say hi to Boo? And I went, or hey to Boo. And I looked at this man, I had no idea who he was. And I I think I probably just shrugged and walked out the door because I didn't know who he was. Talking about sort of having fun on set and not really getting the whole concept of it, because as you say, you were nine or 10, there is that really powerful scene on the porch with you on the swing. You were to cry. And you're a kid having fun thinking this is fabulous sitting on a porch and whatever else. Tell me the interesting story, how it was they were able to get you to cry. They had this little vial that had like onion juice in it or something. And I think they had to blow that in my eye. And, you know, they were trying to be helpful. They were like, have you ever lost a pet? Have you? And I was like, well, yeah, but <laughs> it's, I mean, I don't know. I I just had a real hard time with that. Now, the great Harper Lee, author, of course, of To Kill a Mockingbird, did you have much to do with her? No, not very much at all. I mean, we did some press photos. Um, Atticus had a story that he used to tell about when Miss Nell came to visit. And we were doing the scene at Mrs. Dubose's house. And he had that scene where he had to walk up and come around the corner of the house and say hello to Mrs. DeVos. And um, when Bob Mulligan called cut, uh, Atticus went over to Miss Nell and um, she had a smile on her face and he's getting all puffed up, you know, thinking, oh, she thinks this is really good or whatever. And he, she said to him, you have a little pot belly, just like my daddy. <laughs> so much for great acting, right? Oh, my gosh. I, I also was fascinated by this, that you, Mary, had never read the book until I think you were 36. Well, it was really interesting because there were so many characters that I knew nothing about. 
I knew mm -hmm. nothing about that. And, you know, these other people that were in there that anybody who wasn't in the film, I, I was clueless. And uh, that was really um, interesting. And there was so much more, the house fire and all of the, the scenes uh, that completed uh, a better picture of all of the characters. There was so much more in the book. So for me, that was that was really interesting. Miss Lee, toward the end of her life, she felt that her life had been completely consumed by To Kill a Mockingbird. Would that be an apt description? It's hard when people can't look beyond that to the person. Um, I mean, I now that I'm older, I have a sort of sense of that. There was so much more to Miss Now that, you know, she loved it when people just took her for who she was and interacted with her without mentioning Mockingbird. She and her sister had wonderful lives there in Monroeville, and she had a very active, wonderful life in her apartment in New York. Um, and one of the last times we visited, uh, she, I asked her, I said, when when do you get back to New York? And she goes, I don't. And I said, well, would you like to go back to New York? And she said, yes, I would. And I said, well, if you want, I'll go with you. Uh, we could, you know, we could go back together. And uh, of course, it it never happened. Her health was not in, a, mm. she wasn't in a position to travel. There were so many conflicting stories around her other novel, Go Set a Watchman, that came out shortly before she died. I'm not sure that she truly ever meant it to be published. Mm -hmm. Miss Nell and I never talked about Mockingbird. We never talked about Watchman or any of that. Um, what we talked about was my kids and my grandkids or, you know, whatever was on at the time, you know, what I was doing or, you know, just it, fun things to keep her spirits up. You talked at the beginning of our chat about your mum having been uh, an actress. Well, your brother, John Badham, um, is a Hollywood director of, of significant note. He directed uh, Saturday Night Fever, of course, with John Travolta. He directed uh, Dracula. This list is so long now. Yeah, John was at Yale uh, studying drama and philosophy and in the worst kind of way wanted to be in the film industry. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is he got a phone call from my mom saying, uh, you know, baby sister's going to be in a movie. <laughs> and he's beating his brains out at Yale trying to figure out how to get into the business. And he's like, what? <laughs> then fast forward. <laughs> Baby sister's been nominated for an Academy Award. <laughs> now, after Mockingbird, you made This Property is Condemned, a wonderful movie with Robert Redford and, and Natalie Wood, and the great Charles Bronson was at and that one as well. What are your memories of working with those three legends? Robert Redford was absolutely one of the sweetest people. He really was so um, kind and understanding. Um, it was a tough shoot. We were down in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and um, it was a long shoot. They were still writing the script as we're filming. I mean, I would get pink pages, blue pages, you know, I mean, they kept changing it. Um, so that was very difficult. Um, Natalie Wood at that time was having a tough time personally, uh, which kind of bled into the, the working, mm -hmm. everyday working of the film a couple of times. It was tough. It was a tough shoot. And I had to grow up very quickly uh, to keep up. And uh, but we, we managed. And I think that 
the end product speaks for itself. You also had the honour of starring in the very last episode of, of Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone. I had to take swimming and diving lessons. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a fish anyway. I loved being in the water. But I had to take diving lessons and I had to learn to hold my breath underwater for a long period of time. And they had to get it up to a certain point. I think it was like a minute or a little over a minute where I could hold my breath. And then uh, Timmy Stafford, who played my brother, his mom and my mom were both from England and they became very good pals. And we um, would go over to their house and visit. And um, my mother, had always wanted a mink coat <laughs> and so had Anna Lee right so they bought this mink coat together and the coat would go from one side of the country to the other if, if one had a, something that they needed it for they would ship it back and forth so when mom passed away I shipped the coat back to Anna Lee and she's she called me on the phone and she said, darling, this was your mother's coat. And I said, no, this was y'all's coat. This, this coat goes back to you. And she just laughed. She said, well, that's great. You know, Mary, you look back at your acting career, you clearly had enormous natural talent. So there's probably people watching now thinking, why did you decide to cool your career when really you could easily become one of the hottest things in Hollywood. There were a number of reasons. My, my family and I had a meeting, my, my mom and my dad, and they were very big into education. My dad was older. Um, he was 60 years old when I was born. Mm -hmm. So he was always concerned that he would not live to see me get married or anything. And of course he did, thank goodness. Um, they were saying that they thought that I should get an education so that I could stand on my own two feet. That made perfect sense to me. Um, acting was not something that I wanted to do. It was not something that I chose to do. It was something that just happened. And it happened that it was fun and it was interesting and I learned a lot. But I, I knew that an education was my best hope of survival. Uh, so I went to school, went away to school and um, met my husband my senior year of school. When he got ready to graduate, he said, well, I guess we should go back East and get married. And I said, well, yeah, he was my best friend. I didn't want to lose him. And mm -hmm. uh, We've been married ever since. <laughs> He's still my best friend. And you're a mom. Are you a grandma? A grandma, yeah. I've got um, two girls and, and a boy. And um, they're great. I, I love being a grandma. I just wish that I had more time with the children because they live in Tennessee and I'm traveling all over the place all the time for work so I don't get to see them very often but we um, talk together on the phone and and that's in text we text a lot which is good so now you've spent a lot of time many years traveling America talking to students talking to women's groups about to kill a mockingbird it must be really something for you to get that feedback yeah it's it's still such a necessary story to tell the children today are so far away from that time period and there's a lot of things that they don't understand about the way things were done uh, we're still fighting uh, you know for women's rights I mean we've gained some rights but now there are people who want to take those rights away and put us back in the box. And I, for one, am not being put back in that box. I'm, I'm just not having it. And I don't want my girls to have to go back in that box. Um, I remember 
having to have your father's signature to get a checking account before you were married um, or if if you were married you had to have your husband's signature to get a checking account or have a credit card or get a bank account it was it was just not not right girls don't understand that they don't know about that stuff what we live through um and we're revisiting a lot of that um male dominated you know stuff it's just it's hard now mary i find you are in denver colorado right now and it was last year you made your stage debut in a touring company of to kill a mockingbird opposite That's the right. fabulous richard thomas who many know from the waltons you're not playing scout this time around so tell me who you are playing I play Mrs. DuBose. It's, you know, an opposite of yes. Scout. It's a great group of actors. Um, and I've had so much fun learning about theater and learning about these different actors that uh, I'm working with. They're lovely people. We've got a really tight knit group. Uh, we work as a team and it's, it's lovely. It really is. I've really enjoyed it. It's hard work because a lot of times we go from city to city. We may only be someplace for like a week and then we have to pack up and move on. Um, it's been fun and to be able to see and enjoy cities that I haven't ever been to before. Um, and reconnecting with friends from cities that I've been to before. And of course, the great Aaron Sorkin, he tooled that for the stage. I was terrified. I didn't know that I could do this because they invited me up to come see the play. And I thought, oh, that that's lovely. You know, and I saw the play and I got to meet with the cast and um, that was great. I went home and then later this phone call comes. <laughs> And they want me to come to New York to, to read and, and do the play. And I thought, I don't know if I can do Mrs. DuBose. I mean, she's <laughs> a really ugly, hateful character to be that vile, <laughs> in other words. Um, so I had to, to really think about it. And I made some phone calls to my African-American friends and said, you know, they're, they're wanting me to come and, and maybe do this. And almost to the person, they said, go, this is important. Um, and you make her just as vile and hateful as she needs to be. I mean, we're still dealing with people like this. Um, and it's, it's sad that we have to keep going through down this road uh, but it's important it's interesting to see how parenting has evolved through the years um, parents didn't used to be very involved with raising of their children in a certain middle class to upper class group of people they often left it to the servants to raise mm -hmm. the children mm -hmm. so the character of calpurnia is so important in this raising of these children with atticus and the thing i love about the play is jacqueline williams who plays calpurnia is so brilliant and aaron sorkin has given Calpurnia a voice. We finally get to hear what's going on up here with her. And with Tom also, he gets a voice with the play, um, which is very different uh, than the book. But it, it gives you a fuller, richer look at it. And here's these two people in such a horrible time period uh, 
desperately trying to raise healthy, mindful children who are educated. That's part of um, what's so wonderful about this, this play is that we have a, a modern look at all of that, all those themes. This is not just a black and white story of the 1930s. This is here today, now. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. They have their own racism and bigotry that they are dealing with. We have to like expand our horizons. We have to look at the big picture. You can't just look at one little tiny corner of this. This is, this is a world issue that we're dealing with. Um, so I want people to get out there and open themselves up to loving everybody, you know, to take, to take whatever trips you can and expand your world. And the interesting thing is, too, it's a story to kill a mockingbird so incredibly close to your heart. I mean, it's kind of like it's almost in your DNA. That's how intrinsically linked you are. I know that Bruce Willis and Demi Moore have a daughter named Scout. <laughs> Do you have people coming up to you saying, I named my daughter in honour of the character you played? Yes. <laughs> um, and... You know, there's there's a lot of um, children, dogs, cats, horses, <laughs> also that have been named <laughs> after me and after Atticus. <laughs> and, um, it's really great. And and when I used to go with Atticus on his what he called his little dog and pony show. Um, there would be members of the audience who would stand up and say, I went to law school because of your character. Um, you know, the, my, my parents named me for the character of Atticus. And, you know, with me, I, I've met people who have uh, had interesting lives because of their connection with this book and this film. Mary Badham, you're an amazing inspiration to think that you didn't want to become an actress. All of a sudden that role lands in your lap. And by virtue of that, you are carrying the torch and spreading such a positive message of equality, which is just priceless. It has been really lovely to chat with you. This has been an education for me because now I know where to look on the book. That's right. <laughs>